market. So we started the investigation and eight years later busted the largest lottery fraud in U.S. history uh, based on some really crazy evidence and uh, ultimately put a person was sentenced up to 25 years in prison. A good board of directors has a good legal person, a good accountant, maybe marketing, operations, and they give you advice on ways to oversight and things that you may not think about because entrepreneurs and small businesses are great at ideas, but often when a company becomes successful, awful at growing execution. As you're dreaming all those ideas and you bring your friends together to say, what do you think about? What would you do differently? What would you add? Be sure people around the table don't look just like you. In today's world, you have all of this vast diversity of race, sex, uh, gender, all of the different things that you want. You want everybody in there because you can market to everybody. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Global Achievers. On this episode, we're going to be talking about fraud management. So if any small business owners are struggling with fraud, then this is the perfect episode for you. We have Terry Rich joining us today. He was instrumental in solving the largest lottery fraud in U.S. history. We're going to find out from him how hot dogs and Bigfoot actually played a part in solving those crimes. So stick around, we'll be right back. Welcome back. We have Terry uh, joining us from Des Moines, Iowa. Terry, good morning, how are you today? Oh, everything's going good. It's been a hot summer, but uh, always uh, in Iowa, you, you next day, it's always a different temperature for sure. Okay. Sounds like uh, Toronto here. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, perfect. So we got a, a lot to get through, but I guess we'll start off uh, with your appearance on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson back in 1981. That's probably what I was best known for and really gave me my start to my career. Mm -hmm. um, I had a small town that I grew up in. A guy called and said, hey, would you be interested in helping us get some publicity? And so uh, we got together. And this is where I learned the steps of creativity. We got together. We brainstormed. We had no judgment. Any idea was a good idea. And he finally looked at me and said, you know, you're our most famous celebrity. So I said, we better adopt somebody. So we sent out a press release. And I sent 44 press releases out, hoping someone might consider doing a little publicity for this little town of 50 and lo and behold one person called uh, associate it was united press international guy named bruce canner and he said he threw it on the national wire and immediately we got a call from a talent coordinator to the tonight show and they said we'd like to uplink from your little town and do a split screen with johnny because he was from iowa and we thought it'd be fun you guys look like you're having a good time well lo and behold we got to, they couldn't figure out the technical deal for that, but we got to go out and be on The Tonight Show. And uh, it was the first 20 minutes, Tom Jones was after us, 20 million homes, kind of took my career off. But I took that idea, the, the, you know, it's fun to be on The Carson Show, but the idea of doing a satellite uplink, I took that back to what I was doing in professional life, and that was cable television and promoting HBO. And we started doing free HBO previews uh, via satellite, to everybody across the nation. And the first weekend we did it, we sold $15 million. So I always say that it's better to have tried and failed than su to succeed at doing nothing. So that's that's how we got on The Tonight Show. It was really fun. Okay, excellent. And uh, from there, could you walk us through your timeline of some of the things that you've done since? I always thought that I would start out and be with one company. My dad said, work hard at 62, you get your social security, you're going to be happy. And I realized that happiness happens on the way to success. And I started in cable television, as I mentioned, and uh, at age 40, we got cashed out. We, I didn't realize that, uh, you know, you have people from the outside trying to come in and take over your company. And lo and behold, I got a lot of money at age 40 because I had all these stock options and stock. So I started my own company then and uh, did these free previews and branched that out to uh, ESPN and Stars and the Disney Channel and did it for quite a few years, did a lot of pay-per-view events with Bo Holyfield and age 50, midlife crisis, uh, which basically says I was working so darn hard, made the money I thought I needed when I was 60, but now I'm, I was 40, 45, and uh, decided to start my own company and, and do these free previews and everything went really well, but I was on the road all the time, so I wanted to be home with the kids and try something different. 
So I got a call to say, would you be interested in running a zoo? The local zoo was being run by the city and, the, and a foundation wanted to take it over and wanted a business person to run it. Well, that sounded like fun. I grew cattle when I was growing up on a farm. What's the difference between that and a giraffe? So I ran a zoo for uh, about five or six years and then got a call from another governor, the current governor, who said, hey, the lottery director uh, just uh, resigned, uh, retired. Would you be interested in running the lottery? So I ran the lottery for 10 years and gave over a billion dollars away. So that was really a fun experience. And now I travel the country doing uh, professional speaking. So I've had four distinct, uh, completely different careers, all on my own timeline, and it's been a fun life. Yeah, indeed. Indeed, it has been. So um, obviously, this is what brings us to the most interesting topic of all is how you went about solving the biggest lottery fraud in U.S. history. So, well, as you uh, can tell, yeah, I love uh, I love marketing and promotions, and I hear I'm the lottery director, and that's yeah, pretty easy. You know, you try to get people. People like to gamble. You're promoting within your state. And about two years in, I get a call to say something screwy. We had someone try to claim a prize, and they just wanted us to send them $16.5 million. And they'd send us a ticket. They won't come in. Uh, well, that's screwy. So we decided not to pay it, and we started an investigation because they wouldn't tell us who bought the ticket. It was a lawyer who called, said that he bought it. And we had if you buy a ticket in any lottery state now, you're going to be on camera. And in this particular instance, we had audio and video. And we knew it wasn't the guy that called that said he had the ticket. So we started the investigation and eight years later busted the largest lottery fraud in U.S. history uh, based on some really crazy evidence and uh, ultimately put a person was sentenced up to 25 years in prison. Mm. So I'm sure the audience would uh, like to know a little more about that. So maybe if you could just walk them through, you know, some of the things which happened along the way. I'll do that, and during that, I'll tell you a few things. If you're committing crimes, what you shouldn't do because you're going to get caught. So <laughs> first off, the guy tried to claim it. We said, no, we're not going to pay it. Um, and so we started the investigation. just seemed too screwy that, that uh, he did it. Well, we ultimately realized he, gave the, he got the ticket from a lawyer in New York who got the ticket from a lawyer in Texas who had a client who was, uh, had said that the client bought the ticket. Well, as we did all of the research, we knew the client's name and the person that bought the ticket because we had the video and audio, that was one of our last pieces of evidence to release to the public because if you say, hey, and, and if you ever see it's up on the, on the web, up on, the, on uh, the internet, you can see that the guy was dressed in a hoodie. He looked like he was three, 400 pounds and we knew the lawyer was only a hundred and buck fifty and, and was wearing, he said, tweed pants and a suit coat. Uh, we knew they were different, but when this guy walked in, he asked for that. He bought two hot dogs, uh, which was, was intriguing. He paid with a $50 bill, and he, we had his video and audio. So ultimately, after three or four years of not being able, and we were losing the statute of limitations of trying to solve this case, we decided to release the video. When we released the video, we immediately started getting indications that it might be a gentleman who worked for the Lottery Association of the U.S., uh, who did the programming, he was a security officer who did the programming of the computers that drew this particular game's numbers. You know, Powerball, Mega Millions, they draw balls, but in this instance, it was a computer. And lo and behold, we started doing a lot of investigation and realized that this guy was best friends of the individual who had hired the lawyer, that hired another lawyer, who hired the third lawyer, trying to lay her up here, uh, who, bought, who had the ticket that was trying to get it cashed. When we put those two together, uh, we started figuring out that something had to be wrong here. It was circumstantial, so we went to trial. He was found guilty of two, uh, two counts of buying a ticket when he was not allowed to, illegally to, to buy those tickets. And obviously the idea was that he programmed the computer so he knew what the numbers were going to be. So he had his, uh, he had his brother come up and testify to say how good a guy he was. And his brother said, wait a minute. That guy in the video was buying two hot dogs, and Eddie's not a hot dog guy. Well, come to find out, everybody, including the Associated Press, looked over at Eddie, the main defendant, who was the programmer, and said, wait a minute, he's probably 250, 300, maybe 400 pounds. He doesn't like hot dogs. And the AP guy thought it was so funny, he wrote it down and put it on a national press about this trial, and it went to an FBI agent in 
Texas and said, that brother who testified about the two hot dogs, that his brother doesn't eat those hot dogs, we've been investigating him about money laundering, and he told us that he had bought a ticket in Colorado and won. That's where he got his money. Whoa, so they called us, and all of a sudden we have a big national, the largest lottery fraud in, in U.S. history. And we ultimately cracked it with the two hot dogs, and also the brother in Texas was hiring Bigfoot friends, he was a Bigfoot hunter, to, to claim the tickets. All of those came together, and we got full confessions from all three and how they actually did the deed uh, to try to fraud the lotteries across the nation. And in mm. fact, they had gotten by with it in two or three states before they hit Iowa. Wow. So we had hot dogs, we had Bigfoot, all of it played a part in solving the crime. Uh, now, uh, speaking of crime and fraud, uh, unfortunately, all businesses um, are affected by some sort of fraud, dishonesty, whether it's internal or external, right? So Absolutely. What we learned, I think you're going to ask me, what did we learn by doing that? We learned, I learned a couple of things personally that your your uh, viewers might might uh, be able to do. But um, the the thing is, in an organization, if you run an organization, big or small, and usually a lot of small organizations like church secretaries, uh, school business administrators, if you write the purchase order and you pay the bit and you pay with the check, the same person, you're ripe for fraud. You need to have checks and balances and in any other any organization there's a triangle that the uh, u.s association of certified fraud examiners will show you that says there are three things that people steal internally or the reason they do number one is financial need now everybody wants more money right you want to make more i want to make more but at some point if somebody's gambling and they run out of money they got to pay their kids tuition they got to pay their car payment or whatever Somebody hits a divorce often does this, drinking, gambling, all of those. People need more money and they get desperate. So that's one. But they really don't steal if they don't have the second one, which is opportunity, and the third one, which I'll tell you in a second. But opportunity means that you can write the PO and write the check. No one knows that you're stealing. But if two people do it, it's a little tougher to steal and the little devil on your shoulder says don't do it. The third one is rationale. So rationale, opportunity, and financial need are the three things that all kind of trip and if those collide then people think they have the wherewithal to actually steal from that company and the rationale is the toughest one i think to manage and administer but you can usually tell uh, if someone thinks they're overworked they're they don't make enough money john's making more money than i am so i'm i deserve this kind of money that's where people hit the rationale but the second thing is now i'm going to tell you the secret from the cop side is when uh, opportunity, if you do all of this, how do people get caught? One, they usually start small. Well, I just, you know, I'll take a few pieces of paper home or I'll use the company's uh, computer or, or copy machine, that sort of thing. But then they get by with that, then they do a little more. They get bigger and bigger and ultimately they step in themselves and, and, and get caught. That's what happened in this case too. Eddie tried a couple of smaller ones and then he went after the great big one. The other is if you use social media or your cell phone, you're caught. Because the first thing the cops go to, they'll go to your cell phone and see who you talk to, uh, who you text, and then get all that information with a uh, uh, warrant or subpoena to, uh, to figure out where you were standing two years ago, three years ago. It's amazing how much data cops can get just from your cell phone. Of course, then they have all your contacts. So if you're doing something illegal with somebody else, they have all of those contacts. And then they're also busted. Uh, and the other is social media. Uh, they'll look to see who your friends are. So then go investigate and talk to them. <clears throat> and all of your friends are are in your deal, and they'll be able to see all of the communications you have. So the thing I learned is don't do. Don't do stupid things. Don't do not do things illegally. And uh, then you don't have to, you can sleep at night and not have to worry about what the heck's going on. Okay, perfect. Uh, very good advice indeed. Now, in terms of business owners, um, you have already mentioned checks and balance, and of course, that's one of the most important things. But how does a small business owner put systems in place which sort of deters, uh, you know, uh, fraud in the first place? I think there's, I think there's a couple of things. Number one um, is to have good, uh, try to find some good policies. I mean, uh, uh, work with other companies to get policies when somebody's hired 
There's got to be one thing. They have to sign a document that says, if I steal, I can be fired. Because that helps that little devil on the shoulder to realize, you know, I didn't, I, I don't know if I'm going to get, you know, if this is good or bad. But you have set up that if you do this, you will be disciplined. If you do this, you may be fired. Uh, I think that's one. The, the other is to have a good accountant and, and a good auditor. Uh, having a third-party auditor is really important. And I, most people are scared of tax you know, uh, tax returns that people come in and, and overlook something. Uh, auditors the same way. People don't like auditors coming in. But if you're paying an auditor, an auditor comes in, and you think that John over here in purchasing may be stealing a few things or sending a few items to their own home, you can ask that auditor to, to take a look at that. And then you're not the bad person questioning John. It's that, hey, the auditor said something screwy here, John. What's going on? It's a, it, it, I, I love auditors in that they really are worth their their bucks, one, and checking you know, those checks and balances, and two, letting John know that we're watching, you know, and every other employee that we're watching. So if you have a policy to say, if you do something, you may be fired, so they know there's consequences. Uh, the two is to have oversight and all that. And third, if you're a small business, I, I always, when I started as an entrepreneur, I always felt that you tried to get a good advisory board of directors. Ask them if some pe friends may do it for free, but people you know is to be on a board of directors so that they can kind of give you advice and oversight of what's going on. And if you're a decent company, you have to start paying them a little bit or give them a little bit of stock so that a good board of directors has a good legal person, a good accountant, maybe marketing, operations, and they give you advice on ways to oversight and things that you may not think about because entrepreneurs and small businesses are great at ideas, but often when a company becomes successful, awful at growing execution. Okay, excellent. And speaking of growing, this is where I'm going to come to the next point, which is that whether it's the zoo or the lottery, you've had an excellent track record of growing and scaling uh, those operations. What are some of the things that you would recommend for any entrepreneur who's struggling with achieving growth? And again, it's going to be different for every industry and all that. But in general, are there certain things that you would say that they must do in terms of scaling their business? Well, I have an old expression. It's better to have tried and failed than to succeed at doing nothing. And, and also failure is a first step to success. I, I think about having grandkids and they come over uh, when they first are crawling, all of a sudden they pull themselves up on the couch, take a step, and what do they do? Boom, they fail. They fall down. But they're not smart enough to know, hey, I wasn't supposed to do that. They get back up and take two steps and three steps, four steps, and ultimately they're running clear across the house. And I think the things that happen in an, uh, in an entrepreneurial business is you get started and one idea doesn't work and all of a sudden you're done. You got to think about ways to create ideas. The other is making sure you have diversity in ideas. I love to take a two-step approach when I was an entrepreneur. One, and it's called daring to, uh, daring to dream than daring to act. We all have that million dollar idea. So say it's banana ice cream. So you start your banana ice cream store and you put your business plan together. You have a hundred uh, uh, customers. And then what happens? That's those hundred customers. Some of them die. Some of them move away. So you got to innovate again. You got to take the step to try something else to add to that to keep that company growing. And that's so important. Many people, if you look at any business model, you go up and then you level off. And until you innovate again uh, to go up, it's really important. So as you're dreaming all those ideas and you bring your friends together to say, what do you think about? What would you do differently? What would you add? Be sure the people around the table don't look just like you. In today's world, you have all of this vast diversity of race, sex, uh, gender, all of the different things that you want. You want everybody in there because you can market to everybody. And so you, you try to get as big a bushel basket together as possible of ideas without judging any of them. And then you get your team together and say, okay, well, what do you think works? And then the accountant can say, well, that's going to cost too much. Or the legal folks might say, hey, you're going to get sued if you do that. So you prioritize, and the one at the top usually works really well. Mm -hmm. And then back to taking that first step, you take that and develop it into the new one. So you are always got something innovative. Look at any successful company. They're always diversifying in what they're trying to do or what they're trying to offer. So if your banana ice cream store hits 100 and all of a sudden you're back down to 94, 92 because people are dying and moving away, if you innovate and you add pistachio 
ice cream. Now you're back over 100 and you're 105, 110. So that is important in any new business or any entrepreneurial business to always be looking ahead and adding to what can we do to broaden our, our customer base and to make it work with some of the craziest ideas that no one else has done. Because if you've had a successful business to start out with, you've got another good idea to make work. Excellent. Uh, awesome advice. Uh, so what is your leadership style? You have worked in very large organizations with very diverse teams. What has been your success factor in leading these teams? Um, I would say the, the, the background that helped me be successful were there was my parents and the bosses I had were very encouraging. Even when I failed, they were, well, have you tried or thought about this? Hey, you know, yeah, that was a good idea, but try something different. I, it was always encouraging and I try to be encouraging with that. I have a tough time disciplining people. I don't like to do that. So I, I surround myself with a good HR person and a good legal person. So if somebody messes up, they have that conversation and encourage them of here's what we expect. And again, writing down what's expected as an employee is a big deal because if I know what's expected, I'll try to make that. If I don't, if I'm just coming in, what do I do? So they then help me in, in that discipline. And I try to, I've always tried to play the good guy or the good manager in that point to when people succeed, I broadcast it loud and proud. And if they don't, we work to coach to take them to the next level. So that, and then, if I'm out being crazy enough to try some new ideas that everybody's saying, eh, I don't know about that, maybe that also encourages them to say, well, have you thought about how, well, let's do this. Because when I worked in the cable business, everything we touched turned to gold. So everybody was throwing around ideas and they were all working because cable television was so new and so exciting that, uh, th that it made it work. So I think that probably is the style that I, I like. The dilemma I have, and, and the other thing that I try to do is surround myself with a good detail person, because I'm not. I, uh, as you probably tell already, I've probably said 25, 30 ideas that people might be able to use already, not focused on one. My, my expertise and what I like doing is absolutely throwing all sorts of things on the wall. I think they call it the, uh, the pigeon effect. You uh, come in, swoop in, poop all over the place, and take off. You know, you give a lot of ideas. Okay, perfect. So um, as we're winding down, uh, I, I am personally very interested to know one thing is that you've had a very exciting career. You've done great things. What is the one thing, if we can actually pinpoint that, right? Is there one thing that you're most proud of? Um. I think that the the zoo we we built a an organization that uh, was losing six hundred thousand dollars a year. It was a great give back, you know, a personal give back. And so it was losing six hundred thousand. We cash flowed it and raised fifteen million dollars. So it'll be around through COVID or anything else. The interest off the endowment will help keep it afloat. And when I go out now with my grandkids or I look around, everybody's smiling. I think of all the things we did to keep it afloat, to keep it going, was probably a give back. Um, I always wanted to be a game show host. Never, I, I've done it kind of in commercials and things like that. But I had someone the other day say, what, what would be the one or two things you'd advise people who are just getting started? And I, I think that number one is, I always am proud to raise my hand uh, if someone said, hey, the, when I first started, bathrooms need cleaning. Or here's, here's a project, anybody want to take it on? I'd always raise my hand whether I understood or what, because you get noticed when you raise your hand and you volunteer and you do something. You'll move up the chain very quickly. The other is, which I did not accomplish, uh, I'm still trying, still trying to figure it out, is learning early in my life of how to relax. I've, I've never really, it's always every time I see something or if I drive to the grocery store and I make it in 18 minutes and 33 seconds, I'm thinking, how can I make it in 18 minutes and 32 or how could I make something better? And every time I hear of a new project, I get all excited. How could I get involved? And I got to realize you work hard, but you've also got to take care of yourself, both physically, mentally, when it's done. And relaxing is, is a tough thing. Some people read books, some people do other. I wish I'd have learned earlier how to take some time off and, and relax. And I think Damon John taught me something. You try to learn something. I try to learn something new every day, you know, whether that's reading, watching TV, whatever, doing events like this with you. Um, Damon John, who's on Shark Tank, told me that what he does is every night he's got a list of about t uh, seven things, six, seven things. Next morning he looks at it and revises it. And I'm thinking, 
wow, you get that many million dollar ideas that you're thinking about every day? He said, no. He said, these are six or seven things I'm going to do personally for myself. All my life I've been helping others. Everybody's pitching me, trying to get a piece of me to take some of my money to invest in something. This is a, these are the little things I'm going to do for myself. I'm going to have my Raisin Bran cereal this morning, or I'm going to exercise or do yoga. And he, he says, I do four or five things for myself, and I realize I'm doing something that enriches my life to make me more successful and energetic in helping others. So I thought that was a good advice. Excellent advice indeed. Jerry, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I really appreciate that you've added so much value to um, you know, new entrepreneurs or even people who are sort of in that stage where they are you know, maybe struggling with growth, they're about to take off, but maybe there's something holding them back, right? And I think everyone goes through that in their entrepreneurial journey. Now, Terry, if someone wanted to find you, where would they look? Pretty easy. It's uh, terryspeaks.com. Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, speaks.com, and got contact information, all the background. And you know what? One, one other thing I'd like to pass along, which I think is a, is a pretty good point here is a mowers outside here mowing my yard oh my oh my gosh um is people uh often ask you know how do you how do you keep it going when you're an entrepreneur and what i started doing once i got out because my dad went through the depression lost everything he always told me pay cash for everything anytime you can take as few partners as you can because if you have a partner you have another boss uh but what I tried to do is every time I had a success in a business, I took 10% and that's what I used for play money to do the next one. Now, some people gamble with that, their little extra money. I take that money and keep the rest and put it in a safe investment and take 10% to look for that next new venture to have fun with. And that's proven to help really help so that I just don't throw the whole thing away and lose everything I've got. Awesome. Excellent. Um, Terry's information will be in the description box below please reach out. And um, it's actually a very um, informative website. I've checked it out. Uh, please do so. Again, Terry, thank you so much for your time. And I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks for watching. We really appreciate that. If you like what you saw, give us a like. It really helps with YouTube's algorithm. If this is the kind of video that you want to watch, then subscribe to the channel. And finally, if there's a type of professional you want featured on a future episode, then let us know in the comment box below. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next one.